Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. This is a special edition of The Journey Home. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is the beginning of the 13th season of The Journey Home. I don't think Mother Angelica and I uh, thought this program would be going this long, but uh, it, by the work of the Holy Spirit, it continues. We'll talk about that in a moment. <clears throat> what I've always done for this particular episode of The Journey Home is to invite back uh, guests that are, are good friends, special guests that would help us celebrate uh, the beginning of a new season. Mother Angelica has actually appeared on this particular episode uh, several times, but uh, I couldn't think of any other couple that I would more love to invite to this program than the couple that's joining us tonight. They've been on not only the Journey Home program before, but on many other EWTN programs. You're very familiar with them. Uh, Dr. Scott and Kimberly Hahn. It's great to have them on the program. And we're going to have some phone calls and emails for them in a moment. But let me first do as I always do, is welcome you to the journey home back, great Scott, to be with Kimberly. You, Thank you so and much. And happy so anniversary yes. for this. <laughs> that, that's amazing. Year, it is. I'm going to uh, make a comment that uh, I've, we've said a bazillion times is, uh, would you ever have thought that here we would be? Uh, years ago, uh, and I'm going to let the audience know that I've known this couple for quite a while. And I can tell some things <laughs> about this couple because we were in seminary together mm -hmm. 30 and years 30 years ago, exactly right. And, um, you know, it still amazes me when I, if I try and remember back because uh, we weren't as good of friends then as, as we are now. I mean, I knew of you. You were far too Calvinist for me. And, uh, and I, like I always say, I played too much sports uh, than buried my nose in the books like you both were great students. But, but when I think back on that, I do remember, and, and which I've always said, I think that's the reason why when, when you two came into the church and I heard about it later, the reason that I was so open to your witness is because I've always known your integrity and your love for Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what was behind, even when you were staunch Calvinists, it was because you were deeply committed to Jesus Christ to follow what was true. And at that time, our knowledge of what was true was a bit truncated because of our past. Right. But actually, Oh, this gets in another area, but because you know your journey into the church was really a trajectory of some of the things we had learned in seminary. It sure was truth of what we learned in seminary, and mm. so in that sense, we're very thankful. Mm. Very thankful to the so, seminary we went to. Yeah, I like to mm -hmm. say it this way: I am more grateful for my evangelical formation today than on the very day I was ordained a Presbyterian pastor. Mm. I mean, I was very grateful at that moment, but I look back and I realize, okay, there were flaws, there were gaps. But there was so much substantial truth that uh, we got. And we look back, and becoming Catholic is not subtraction, it's addition. The good news just keeps getting better. You know? And I would take it back even further and say it really uh, traces back to the heart of the home in which I was yeah. brought home yeah. from the hospital and in which I was raised. And I am so deeply grateful for my parents and their faithfulness to God for all that they um, really commit to him every day. I'm yeah. very, very yeah. grateful. Yeah, actually, I knew you, before, I mean, your father before I knew you. I believe yeah, we that. We played golf yeah. together yes, and we used okay. to go on, <laughs> on uh, minister retreats oh, wow. together. And I remember him. I remember the time that he became very, a staunch warrior against pornography. Yeah. And I remember him when he showed up on that retreat and we talked about that and, and he saw in his heart how much he saw that that was, was destroying people's lives. Right. And at that retreat, one of the ministers opened up. Mm. It never opened up before because of the witness of your father. Mm. And that's, we saw that good thing. Now, the audience, you, you've 99.9% .9 of you know their story coming into the church. Uh, if you don't, I think there's a book on it, <laughs> if not a couple. And you know, you've told the story on EW10. Rome Sweet Home is the book that, that has changed so many lives, including my own uh, and your stories on EW10. But I, I always ask the guests to at least give a little five-minute summary of why the Lord opened your heart to the Catholic Church for those that might not know or not remember all the details. Yeah. All right. Which well, first? <laughs> You'd have to go first since your yeah. story's first. Okay. I'll try to do it in two and a half minutes to leave the second <laughs> half of that five-minute slot for her. You know, I was uh, raised in a nominal Protestant family. We didn't go to church all the time, and it didn't make much of a difference. 
I got into a lot of trouble as a juvenile delinquent at the age of 13, 14, <laughs> and then I got saved through Young Life. I remember hearing the gospel in a way that just touched my life at precisely the time I needed my life to be changed, and changed by God alone. And the formation that I got for the rest of my years in high school was really steeped in Scripture, but it was also in the Reformed evangelical tradition of Calvinism. And so I became not just your average Calvinist, but a very staunch uh, and vibrant one. So I went off to college studying theology, uh, philosophy, as well as economics, studying Greek, falling in love with the most beautiful gal on campus. <laughs> we teamed up together in Young Life for the last two years of our four-year stint there. And after we both graduated in 79, we got married and got back from our honeymoon, packed up and moved off to Boston to study at Gordon-Conwell. And uh, just through a number of providential circumstances, things happen in a three-year program there. I think the first step was something that Kimberly might relate a little bit more about, but uh, discovering that the Catholic Church had it right on contraception. Mm. I didn't see that one coming. Mm. And she shared that with me, mm. and I had to admit in all sincerity that the, uh, the Catholic Church was right, and so was the Bible, and so was historic Protestantism. But still, I wasn't really willing to give the Catholic Church anything more than just credit for getting one thing right, you know. But it was my third and final year that I began to read the Fathers much more in depth. And I think it was largely for practical reasons, because I was looking for sermon material. I was going <laughs> to, after graduation came ordination, and I couldn't just rob from my favorite preachers because they were on TV or radio, they were published, and so everybody would recognize the sources. So I just began to comb these pages of uh, the Sunday sermons of the early fathers, and I began to realize they read the Bible differently than I did. They read the old and the new together, which is what I strove to do, but they did it in a way that was just much more penetrating. And so after a few months of this, I had graduated, began to preach, and I began to really employ this notion of reading the old and the new together, typology as it was known, as it was known and all of a sudden, everything started coming up Catholic, you know, the Eucharist especially, uh, but uh, baptism as well, and what it meant to be born again. And the whole Gospel of John was most especially yeah. sort of the place where I began to realize, boy, the early church fathers have it here. And in John 6, with the Bread of Life Discourse, the Eucharist, eat my flesh, drink my blood, you know, within less than two years, I had studied and prayed myself into a crisis of faith you know, which required me to kind of step away from the pastorate, step out of the, the, the role I had as a professor at seminary, and then go in search of a church that fit the job description that I found in the whole Bible, not just the New Testament, <laughs> not just with proof text, but reading the new and the old contextually. And uh, it was in the mid-80s, we moved to Milwaukee so I could begin studying for a doctorate at Marquette, thinking I'm going to need at least five years to make this conversion look intellectually respectable. And then I went to Mass secretly. And then a second day, a third day, after two weeks or so of attending daily Mass, I just felt my heart transform, my mind illuminated, and the Scriptures just really coming true in a way I never imagined before. And so when I broke it to Kimberly, after having pledged to her I would wait five years, here I was asking her to pray about allowing me to do it after one year, and barely one, if even that. And she asked me why, and I just blurted it out, because... Delaying obedience to what I know is true is feeling more like disobedience every day. And I hadn't, I, I really hadn't plotted that response. But when I heard myself say it, I realized that was really the bottom line. That was the, the truth of the matter, the heart of the matter. And gracious woman that she was, she came back a few hours <laughs> later and said, I prayed, I'll release you. What are we talking about here? Well, what we were talking about was becoming Catholic at the Easter Vigil of 1986 which was four years before I told her I would, and I think in God's wonderful and humorous providence, four years before she did. <laughs> and that was a tumultuous period for the, for the, for the both of us. All right. Well, my background is different in that my father's a Presbyterian pastor and my mom was a Christian ed director at a church, and so they, they married wanting to establish a Christian family, and I was their firstborn. So... I know I was covered in prayer and taught about the Lord from the beginning. 
And I still had a conversion experience. I still had a moment in which Christ broke through really profoundly in seventh grade and, and where I realized things weren't just true on, on a test that you would take, but, but deeply true Jesus died for me and for my sins. And, uh, and, and it was transforming, even though I was basically a good girl before, but there was an inner transformation uh, that had to be God's work and um, I, you know started prayer meetings and at school and wanting to share I, my Bible was on the top of my books from then on junior high and high school public school and and as I've gone to reunions people have sought me out because they remembered that I was a Christian and knew that I would want to know they had become Christians after high school um, then, college. They might, then they might back out where they figure out where you are. But <laughs> yeah, it's a little strange. Like when I thought you were Christian, you're Catholic. <laughs> yeah, that that had some odd conversations. In in college, we met, and he recruited me for Young Life, and that was just such a powerful experience of ministry, and really opened my heart very deeply to Scott and wanting to be his partner in ministry for life. Um, and so seminary for us was just a chance to go very deep in our faith. And I also earned a master's, different master's, but a, an MA in theology. And, um, and after graduation, being a pastor's wife to me was like the pinnacle. Here we are. You know, he was teaching some seminary classes and, and then really the ground began to move. And at that point I had one baby and one on the way, uh, not feeling like I had leisure to sit and read theology. And really the master's was done. So I didn't really want to delve deeply in my, you know, free, free few moments. And, um, uh, it was, it was very hard. My, my thought was, I, I'm just going to maintain this course and Scott's going to go way out here and I'm just going to wait and catch him on the rebound because I don't need to have this whole, you know, up and down. And, um, and he would try to say, you know, this, it doesn't look like the same faith, but this is like the acorn in the oak tree. One has become the other. And, and this is all interrelated. It's everything that we believe. I'm not repudiating things. Um, but it truly was a crisis of faith for me, um, because I did not want to go yeah. there. And as we left for Milwaukee, you know, I mm. had this promise firmly from him. It would be minimum four <laughs> years and maybe longer. <laughs> And yet it wasn't. When he came with that request to release him, it was 10 days before Easter. Um, and in the process of him converting, we both lost a number of friends. Yeah. Uh, he was not the only one that lost friends. And it was very difficult to know how can our marriage survive this because I felt... a long way from family. Yeah. A long way from yeah. family. And if I, I felt like if I revealed the depth of my pain and anguish to either family, they would rally to my side which it wasn't about sides. And I didn't know if our marriage could survive that. And so it was very hard. I remember writing in my prayer journal, who can I go to, Lord? And do not tell me Mary and the saints. <laughs> you know? That's not what I'm going to do. But, you know, he would, I would hear this little jingle and I recognized that they were rosary beads. And Scott would go out the door having had a difficult conversation with me and here he's going to take a lovely little walk with Mary and, you know, and then have to come back in the house to deal with me. And it was so hard. I mean, to be, to feel jealous of Mary, how do I compete, you know, in a sense. And the turning point for me really in large measure came through the, the challenge of my own dad, mm -hmm. which he had no intention of trying to encourage me in the direction of the Catholic church. But he said to me, do you pray every day the prayer I pray, Lord, I will go wherever you want me to go. I will say whatever you want me to say. I will do whatever you want me to say, do, and I will give away whatever you want me to give away. And a little sarcastically, I said, uh, no, Dad, I don't pray that prayer these days. That would mean becoming Catholic. And he said, oh, honey, this has to do with Jesus being Lord of your life. And, and he said, if you can't pray that, pray for the grace to pray that prayer. And it was 30 days. I, I had jotted it down in my journal, 30 days that I just prayed for the grace to be able to relinquish my life again completely to him. And the beautiful thing is that what God did was instead of locking my heart away, which was my fear, he showed me I was the one who had caged myself and he was unlocking the door. And all of a sudden there was joy in discovery and reading. I mean, it was a mix. It was, I, I did not want to become Catholic. <laughs> you know? 
I mean, and it was not like, well, wasn't Scott smart enough to convert you? It wasn't about brains because there's your heart yeah. has yeah. to be there. But anyway, yeah. this is much longer than five minutes. But yeah. I'm grateful there has absolutely never been one moment that I have said, I am so sorry I did that. Yeah. Well, uh, Not a moment of regret. No. no. Yeah, and, and I think that issue of heart and, and mind are, are true. Uh, and even in our work in the Coming Home Network, we don't, our motto is we don't push, pull, or prod anybody into the church because it isn't just head, nor is it just heart. It's, it, we gotta, it's gotta be right. You gotta sense that this is right within. And right. to me, heart is in feeling. Heart, heart is, a, is your soul. I mean, it's a, it's a deep connection with God. Yeah. You know, I think I was in that class when you studied the, uh, about the contraception. I can't remember what the topic of the class was, but I think we had a fix. Yeah, Christian ethics. Yeah, I was in that class. Okay. I, think, uh, I, I think I was in that class, although I think we had different topics and I dealt with racism was, was the topic that, that I chose. Uh, interesting enough, I think if it's the same class, our teacher was a Young Life guy. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, one of the Young Life people, I don't want to mention his name, yeah. but was one of the Young Life guys, which which also connects us because we were all Young Life guys. I was Young right. Life. I worked for Young Life before I went to seminary. And there's something about the evangelical commitment to Jesus that carries with it the same thing your dad told you. Mm-hmm. And well, her and dad I, was yeah. also Young Life. Yeah. In fact, uh, Jim Rayburn, the founder of Young yeah. Life in Texas, actually recruited her father right out of college <laughs> to bring Young Life to the East Coast to Pittsburgh, which ended up being where his son-in-law was saved through it years later. Yeah. We have an email. That This is good. This is a good time to bring this email in, because after we hear your story, stories, this is a, a, a fine email. It comes from Diane from Alabama. Each week on the journey home, I hear another fascinating conversion story. Why are there so many men and women, even ministers, being called home to Rome now? It's a good email. Yeah. Why now? I mean, well, first of all, do you think, from your experience, the two of you, do you think that in fact we're seeing more journeys home to the Catholic Church through clergy and, and other intellectuals than in the past? Oh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I and, and, and to try to reduce it to one factor would be impossible, but I think you can observe something of a cultural crisis, the likes of which nobody saw coming. Not 30, 40, 50 years ago that we see the collapse of, of, of social and moral values. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, if that had only happened in the world, you know, that's one thing. But for that to have spilled over into the church, the, the mainline denominations and even some of these non-denominational churches that have sprung up in the last century or so, you know, I think that's what's causing a lot of people to take stock and say, you know, as you put it, to go deep into history is to cease to be Protestant, quoting Newman, yeah. but to cease to go, you know, to go deep into scripture, mm-hmm. to go deep into culture, and to recognize, as Father Benedict Rochelle has said, you know, 50 years from now, there might not be a single institution that we know today still standing, except for the Catholic Church. I mean, the, the, the foundations are being rocked, and this is how scripture describes God's judgment at certain periods of history where political government, where economic institutions, where social fabric is torn. And I think all of us are a part of that, and yet we all have our own individual stories, and we have to kind of take a look at, okay, where are we? Where have we been? Where are we going? And why is this denomination or that denomination or this instance? You know, the Catholic Church seems to be the only thing that has made it into the 21st century and really shows that kind of divine life that is going to survive the collapse of yet another civilization. Now, so. And I remember it being struck by Scott's comment, even though at that point I had no interest at all in the church, the Catholic church, but I remember him holding our firstborn Michael, and he was not a year old, and he said, what church will he raise yeah. his children in? And for him, that was such a crisis. It was like, I'm going to tell him this is the truth and try to plant him in a church. And how will I know that, that this will even be here for his children or that he'll be able to do that? Um, 
in my own family. You know, my father's one Presbyterian uh, denomination. I have a brother who's a different Presbyterian. I have a brother who was, and now he's E free um, as pastors. pastors. Yeah. And then, and then the others are members of other denominations. And I think that was one of the things that struck me that's so radically different in the Catholic Church. You have something called a deposit of the faith that cannot be changed. Mm -hmm. Yes, our children need to understand why the church teaches what she teaches. Um, but so it's not rediscovering uh, or reproving it, but it is a discovering, you know, why does the church teach what she teaches and it can't be changed. And that's part of what so many of our friends who are pastors have wrestled with as their denominations yeah. have tended toward a liberal approach. And the only thing they can do is become schismatic and separate so that yeah. they can hold on to the truth. Yeah, the Presbyterian group that I was a pastor of back in 1990, at the rate at which they were losing members, anticipated they would be closed now three years from today because of the rate, and they're still losing at that rate. Yeah. But what I want to get, get to is, it was when you hit me with the First Timothy 3.15 passage, right. when you told your story that well, you got hit and then you hit me with it, in other words, what is the pillar and foundation of truth? And I, like you, with Scripture, and realize no Scripture says it's the church. That really opened my mind. But what, what I wanted to talk about, though, is this issue of why are there so many today? 250 years ago, if we were living in New England near where we went to seminary, there wasn't a Catholic anywhere. For six generations, people could have lived in New England from the time of the pilgrims until the revolution and never have met a Catholic. And so think of how hard it would have been for a Protestant minister in New England, staunchly Puritan, yeah. to be open to the church. The information was not there. Right. It's not anymore. And by the way, as a mm -hmm. footnote to that, one of my favorite theologians was Jonathan Edwards, who was a theologian, pastor, and evangelist in Massachusetts. And, you know, he, he of course he would have circled true, the Pope is the Antichrist, and the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon, and the Reformation is the rediscovery of the gospel. But, in fact, he didn't meet Catholics. So all of He's, that was a continental European phenomenon, you know, and yeah. also in England. But in New England, it was really a chance for Protestantism to kind of find virgin soil, plan itself, and then discover the principles of anarchy that were embedded in Protestantism going all the way back to the early 1500s. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think that's what's coming home. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of these chickens are coming home to roost in this sense that, uh, you know, people will hear, okay, according to the experts, there are over 30,000 different Protestant denominations. You know, once a number gets that big, it's almost meaningless. Yeah. But when you actually experience the disruption, the disintegration of denominations and the splitting of congregations, then suddenly it's not a statistic. It's not an abstraction. It's a heart-wrenching experience. And you see families divide and you realize, God, if you're a father, certainly you must have died, designed this mm. church of yours yeah. with a better policy than just sort of every man for himself when it comes to the Bible. But, and just to illustrate that, a good friend of ours who has now come into the church with his family went to uh, a non-denominational denomination and uh, <laughs> you know and, and association he, probably they call it that's maybe, what we call right. ourselves when, okay. we were, when I was a congregation and you know set up movie theater style so they all stop and get their coffee and literally bring their coffee cups into yeah. into the church and that theater morning uh, yeah theater seating that morning the, the person leading uh, said we're going to do something a little different we've set up communion self serve and so at any time that you feel moved during the service, you just come forward and you just take communion. And at that moment, our friend said, this cannot be what Jesus founded. And I think that's part of what there is a hunger in people's hearts to say, surely the Holy Spirit yeah. has had a plan and he's at work. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to, I want to be a part of that plan. And, and part of the point I, I was making is that EWTN is one of the examples of the, what they didn't have 250 years ago. That's right. That That's right. We have, God has given us this, the media in so many ways so that for the first time, scholars can't hide in some little church in 
in New England right, Northampton, live yeah. their whole life and never in meet isolation. a Catholic. You cannot be in isolation anymore. Uh, you, you see know, the Protestant. You see everything just the way it is. You, you put your finger on something, too, because scholars are now making this move in a way that, say, 13 years ago when the program began. And, you know, when we, when we, yeah, when yeah. we collaborated with you as you had the inspiration to start the Coming Home Network back in the early 90s, you know, for us, it was really ministers and missionaries. Mm-hmm. And, okay, though I was getting a doctorate, though I had that scholarly bent and I was a professor and all of that stuff, I didn't really hold out much hope because in the academy, the, the professional pressures that are brought to bear upon you are not only external in terms of being hired and getting tenure and all of that, but they're also interior. Intellectual pride is certainly the occupational hazard. <laughs> More of the scholar, I think, than the pastor or almost any other group in our society. And so to see that in the last five or ten years, you know, just last week, the great Lutheran theologian Michael Root announced his reception to the Catholic Church. But we've had Bruce Marshall as well. You know, we've had Douglas Farrell and so many others. Francis Beckwith. Francis Beckwith. I mean, not just five or ten, not just 50, well over a hundred academicians, young scholars, middle-aged scholars, senior scholars in scripture, in church history, in philosophy, in ethics, apologetics. It's across the board. It's one of those things where 13 years ago when you began this program, I never would have suggested to you, look around that category for guests, but here you are getting these like Frank Beck with and others. It's remarkable. Yeah, Yeah. it really is. And again, we're seeing that the work of the Holy Spirit, using the media the way it was intended, um, which also reminds me that because we can't hide anymore, it even reminds us how much more, you know, the first Peter passage about being ready at all times to give, give a reason for the hope. That's right. But the verse goes on. A pure conscience. That's right. Our witness needs to be just as strong. And of course, the media has put our dirty laundry out there too. Yeah. But uh, let me ask you that from your experience. Catholics, what, almost 25 years? Or have you been? I yeah, I'm, I'm coming up to my quarter of a century okay. anniversary. All right. yeah. I mean, we see the, the lives and the witness of so many that would be an encouragement to us, but we've also seen scandals. Yeah. Have you seen that affecting the flow of those into the church? Surprisingly not. I mean, you think back to the real explosion of scandal in 2002. You know, at that moment, you would have thought, There's just no way this can continue. Your program, you know, it's going to be, you know, bereft of coming on network. We thought all of a sudden, yeah, and yet within three years, of course, we had the death of John Paul, and then suddenly, you know, it was like going through the worst of times, and then suddenly seeing the best of graces, Mm -hmm. where you know, with the death of John Paul and then the ascendancy of Pope Benedict, came an unexpected springtime of graces and an unprecedented profusion of conversions from ministers, but as I was saying a moment ago, from scholars, theologians, philosophers, biblical exegetes, and so on. Uh, And so you look at that and you realize it's the same kind of thing that Chesterton and many others have commented upon, that the closer you get to the Catholic Church, you know, it's not going to look like a speedboat. You know, it's like this old boat that, you know, This would have sunk a long time ago if it hadn't been designed by Almighty God. You look and you realize it has so many flaws, so many problems. There's just no human explanation for its durability and longevity, except Christ said what he meant. He meant what he said. You know, the gates of hell will not prevail. It was you that prepared me for that. I don't know if you remember, but I was not in the church yet. And uh, we had moved to Steubenville and we were living in the house. And there was one time when I was sicker than a dog in bed. And you stopped over at the house and you said, you know, you might want to read this book just to find out what you're getting into. And you gave me Anne Mugridge's book. Oh, yeah, The Desolate City. Which she just lays it all out She there. sure did. And I remember that. And I came out of that experience with the advice I have given when it comes to the scandal in the church. And this is what I learned from what you told me. Four-step process. Number one, you can't be afraid to look at the church. That's right. We're sinners. It's there. Number two, on the other hand, you also got to recognize that that isn't just sins in the church. It's everywhere else, too. Right. We knew that. The media doesn't always cover the others, but it's in the church. Number three, after you've done that, you look in the mirror. And then number four, you, you recite four, ten times very prayerfully, but for the grace of God go I. I mean, it's us. And then you get ready to go to confession. (laughs) (laughs) And and along with that is realizing that the majority of the church is not here on earth. 
you know, as Protestants, we're, we tend to just so separate heaven and here. And when we realize that the church is, you know, in heaven primarily and yes, on earth and yes, guided by the Holy Spirit. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, you know, oh, 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 <laughs> but, but, but you, 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 you fill out yeah. why I've always loved football. See, I've always loved football because I thought it just the, the idea of football is such a great illustration of teamwork and everything. But the part about the football game that I never thought about was the stands are just as much a part of the game. I mean, that's the full mm-hmm. church. Mm-hmm. Right. The cloud of witnesses. Mm-hmm. And they're not just spectators. I mean, right. they're, they're not dead, for one thing. They're more alive <laughs> than we are. And, you know, the church that was founded on Peter isn't just like was founded on Peter a long time ago. He is more actively engaged in assisting Christ mm-hmm. through his prayer along with the other apostles that are the foundation stones in John's vision there in Revelation 21. I mean, as you say, there are two churches, one up here, you know, one down here, one up there, two liturgy. It's one liturgy. It's one church. And the church in her essential reality is not reducible down to an earthly institution. It really is where Christ and Mary and all the saints and angels are. And when he gave to that, you know, to Peter, the keys of the kingdom, it, it, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, if you look carefully at the Greek, it will have already been bound in heaven. The earthly tail doesn't wag the heavenly dog. It's the other way around. Mm. And and that, that insight, I think, is so often lost even to Catholics. They tend to think of the church as just their parish or their diocese and the chancery or maybe the Vatican, you know, and the papacy. But it's so much bigger. It's not just worldwide. It's universal. It's stretching from earth all the way to heaven, and there alone do you find the members in their perfection. Let's take, just take a pause there and sure. take a break. We'll come back in a moment with some of your questions for Dr. and Kimberly Hofstede. But... Welcome back to The Journey Home, this special edition with uh, two favorites here at EWTN, uh, Dr. Scott Hahn and Kimberly Hahn. It's great to have them back uh, for lots of reasons, good old friends. Um, We've got a caller waiting. Before we go to the caller, just real quickly, uh, you know, you both have written so many books, and I know these are books to help the audience, Catholic or non-Catholic, understand the faith. Uh, If you want to mention one book right now, which one would you like to mention for the audience? Yeah. (laughs) You go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The third in my Bible study series um, on Proverbs 31 called Beloved and Blessed, Biblical Wisdom for Family Life. Okay. Very good. And my latest Doubleday book was the work of the year of the priest. It's called Many Are Called, Rediscovering the Glory of the Priesthood. And it's really designed for young men mm-hmm. who you know who might you know, be considering who could use some encouragement, but it's also designed for priests that could also use some encouragement and just for ordinary Catholics to discover what it is that God has given to us in holy orders. It's an amazing sacrament. In in many ways, the end of the 20th century was a real attack on manhood. Boy, that's a... But it needs to be a I husband, a father, yeah. Yeah. a man. And that's what the, and, yeah, this yeah. book, Many Are Called, is yeah. to show that God you, gives you us You began with that in your book. You yeah. talked about man. Father Joe Friede, yeah. the great quarterback yeah. now, who's a priest in the Pittsburgh Diocese, and, and yeah. many others like him, too, have, have discovered their manhood, not in spite of being priests, but precisely because yeah. of their priesthood. All right. Yeah. We have a caller. On the, on the line. Hello, it's uh, John from Wisconsin. Hello, what's your question for us? Thank you, Marcus. Uh, listen. I've been married for about 30 years, and I've got a feeling that, a calling that I need to become Catholic, and every time I talk about it with my wife, she throws up a wall, and I don't want to tear my marriage apart, and, but, I, I, but I've got this calling or this feeling that God's calling me to the Catholic Church. Do you have any suggestions how I can deal with this with my wife and, you know? Yeah. You know. Thanks, John. Great question. And 
I wasn't sure if you said that she throws up a wall, throws up on the wall, but probably for some it's the same and, you know, when people are not wanting to consider the Catholic Church. Right. But what do you do for John? Well, I'll respond in terms of some of the mistakes that I made. <laughs> <laughs> it's a safe way. Yeah. I would say, first of all, you know, you go to Our Lady and start praying for your wife. Uh, because let's face it, she needs special graces because she's married to you. <laughs> you know, my wife needed special graces because she was married to me. And, uh, uh, you know, the first step is to pray for her more than ever before. The second, I would say, is to get spiritual direction from a priest who is experienced, who's wise, who's not necessarily young and on fire, but old and seasoned veteran, and get that kind of advice. The third thing is to take that advice and to really back off the kind of debating or the kind of setting straight or here, if you'd only read this, you'd get all your questions answered and really intensify the love, the unconditional love, the romance, you know, not any pretentious stuff, you know, but, you know, make it a priority to uh, compliment her, to take her out on a date, to go- do for your bride what Christ does for his. And, I was going to uh, read you a verse, just I love you to comment on scriptures, but right this ahead. particular verse from First Peter about husband's responsibility adds a little bit more than even Paul does when he says, Husbands, live considerably with your wives, bestowing honor on the woman as the weaker sex, since you are joint heirs of the grace of life, in order that your prayers may not be hindered. Yeah. I mean, are we, I mean, how often people say, what can I do to help them come into the church? And when we say, well, pray for them as if it's flippant. Right. right. Like that's all you can do. But it's not, it's substantial. It's substantial. And you can, you can ask your guardian angel to pray. You can ask your guardian angel to work with her guardian angel exactly. to pray. And, and you do need to differentiate. I mean, Scott and I talked a lot about it. The difference between the role of the Holy Spirit and the role of the husband and not to confuse the two. Um, I think the closer you are and marriage has got to be as close as you come it's fewer words, it's greater actions. When Scott began to go to confession and come back different, gentler, you know, looking for ways to serve, it spoke more to me about the truthfulness of the sacrament of confession than going through a Bible study on it. The one thing I would say, which is probably not what you'd expect me to say, is it's very important that you honor Christ before all. Mm -hmm. And when you have that conviction that to not become Catholic would be to disobey the Lord, then you need to release the grace you can release into your family by becoming Catholic. And to the best of your ability, you say to your wife, I'm not doing this to spite you, even though it may not feel like it. I am doing this out of love for you and first and foremost, out of love for Christ. What what do you think about the importance of listening on this? And let let me get to this, that often when... You know, in our work in the Coming Home Network, we've discovered that at least 80% of the time, the, the couples are not on the same page. I mean, it, 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 when you say a three out of four, I mean, and that's understandable for a variety of reasons. But in very, when I hear the stories, what often stops in the road is that as soon as an issue comes up, all of a sudden they're in a debate. Right. Mm-hmm. Rather than, you know, if you're on the journey, that sometimes we just need to listen. What is there you don't like about the Catholic Church? And then instead of getting ready for a debate, is listen. Prayerfully listen to the person so they get it out. And also, what is it you fear the most if I were to make this decision? You know, what is it that that frustrates you the most about how I've done this and I've not included you in the right ways or, you know, I've included you in all the wrong ways, you know? Uh, I think you're right. I think communications... You know, it, it does present us a challenge. It presents one of the greatest challenges to a marriage. And yet it also presents opportunities to mm-hmm. kind of go back and say, look, you know, if only I had shared more honestly or if only I'd been more patient, you know. Uh, but I do think it comes back to this idea where it's faithfulness to Jesus Christ. You know, yeah. and, and you, you can't be glib. You can't just resort to a cliche. You have to say, you know, as far as human beings on earth are concerned, you're the most important human person in my life. But there is a divine person who is the Lord of Lords and your Savior and my Savior. And I won't be able to hide behind you on Judgment Day. I'm going to have to stand alone, give an account to him as to what I did with all the truth he gave me. And if I could just interject one other small thought, and that is this. If I could have gotten Scott to give me one more year or two more years or three more years, I would have without having an intention of 
using that time to come alongside him. I didn't want him to become Catholic. Now, there are probably holier wives out there that would genuinely <laughs> use that time, but I wanted a stay of, of execution. Yeah. And so my plea to him to wait was not a plea of wait long enough and I'll come alongside you. It was, I don't want this to happen mm. and I can keep it from happening if he just waits to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Every that, married couple's, yeah. you know, it's like Peter Crave, what he says about converts. <clears throat> every conversion is like a snowflake. It's totally different. Mm. And every married couple is totally different. And so that's why I think spiritual direction might be the wisest course, especially if you could find the kind of priest who could talk to the spouse who's not interested and who's really putting up a pretty fierce struggle. Uh, because I think sometimes those kinds of priests prove to be even more powerful channel of grace than the spouse, you know. Actually, I think we have an email that might even touch on some of the same issues. This comes from Connie from Detroit. Mm. I can't seem to effectively share my faith with my non-Catholic family. As a recent convert, I want to let them know what a treasure I have found in the Catholic Church, but whenever I, whatever I say seems to fall on deaf ears, even when I quote Scripture. How can I communicate my love for Catholic teaching with my family. Well, I could have typed that email <laughs> because, I mean, <laughs> it's been 25 years for me, and yet on both sides of our family, people are still yeah. really reluctant to even to engage me, even in shallow conversations. You know, and I would say the most important thing is to recognize, again, you're not the Holy Spirit. You just can't kind of go barging into the Holy of Holies, which is how Newman describes the conscience. But I think the best advice I got was from you, and that is the joy of the Lord. You know, the more you experience the joy of Christ as a Catholic, the more you can show people that, you know, I enjoy the life of Christ before I was a Catholic, and it's now the case. I just enjoy it so much more. And don't just do that as a strategic ploy to kind of get them to ask the question, then suddenly you can barge in with all of your arguments and all of the troops that come pouring into that. You know, really just experience the joy and let them see it. And at the same time, be honest with them and yourself. You know, when it's a struggle, it's a struggle. But I think that, that kind of the joy of the Lord is our strength is just, you know, joyless Catholics, I think, are the greatest tool for the devil. <laughs> I want you to go more on that. Uh, John fifteen eleven. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Now think about that. How many Catholics don't get it? Even good, faithful Catholics are fighting each other within the church about, you know, how faithful they are, how traditional or whatever that is. Where's the joy? And it's not just to be a happy thing. It's to be like this. This reminds me of the spiritual life that your joy is to be full. I mean, that's to me, that reminds me of Father DeBay talking about our life is to be a deep, deep, deep fullness. Right. But we miss it. Right. Yeah. I mean, we have to grow in our awareness of how much the God of the universe is intensely in love with us and that he you know it's not our goodness that causes him to love us it's his love that is the cause of our goodness just as his love is the cause of my existence he's loved me into existence he's loved me to the point of my goodness that love is the is the reason for the being of the whole universe and it's what's going to get the whole world through whatever problems we face and it's going to get me through whatever crises i face and god sends these things to us not in spite of his love but because of it and, I, you know, the more you realize this is truth, the more theology becomes therapy. I mean, I, I have studied and taught theology to bring healing to my soul, to overcome worry, sadness, anger, doubt, all of these things. <laughs> Nothing works as well as good theology if you just get it out of the head, put in the heart and realize, God, you love me more than I could possibly imagine. And, and I would have to say, along with that, that it's, it's okay in your heart to acknowledge the deep sorrow of yes, not being yeah. able to share this. It is very hard to have brothers and sisters and parents that you long not only to share the thoughts and ideas, but to share the joy of receiving the Eucharist and, and what that means and how this is a living out more deeply than ever before of the faith that you were given. And I think, I mean, there have been times of, of deep sorrow for not being able to share that and, and to say, I'm going to offer even this sorrow as a gift along with my Eucharist and just, Lord, use this for your glory. And maybe, and maybe your family won't be the family touched most by your faith, 
but it will be other people who are trying to reach their families, you know? And <laughs> yeah. It's good. So it's, yeah, it is joy, but it's also acknowledging that it is real suffering. Well, I, I remember once traveling on the many times we travel, and I was particular time in a really cheap hotel. I can't remember why, but I mean, really cheesy place. When I went to use the shower, there was like three things coming out. You know, you had to jump up into it again. I mean, it was like what? And I looked up, and all the holes were encrusted with you know calcium or whatever. And by running my hand across it, I was opening holes, and all of a sudden I had a full flow. Well, on the one hand, that's why we want our separate brethren to become Catholic. Right. That full flow we want the full and flow. Yeah. And the sad thing yeah. is that Catholics sometimes stuff up the holes with all kinds <laughs> of stuff. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, the, their misunderstandings and, and bitterness and whatever. We want the full flow. Or it's the drinking and the swearing and the, you know, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. the neighbors that are this way and then they'll go, and your brother-in-law is Scott Hahn? And one of my siblings will just go, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's just, yeah, it's We want the not full flow of the joy yeah, and absolutely. mea culpa. You know, I, I want it for my family and myself. We have a, another phone call from Richard in Illinois. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Hi, Marcus, Kimberly, and Scott. First of all, Marcus, I just want to say congratulations on the 13th anniversary of this wonderful program. Thanks. Coincidentally, it was about 13 years ago that I became Catholic uh -huh. after 27 years of marriage. And I have more, uh, more of a statement than a question. Uh, when I went uh, through the RCIA program, my wife, who was a cradle Catholic, came with me every week. And she, to this day, will tell me that she got more out of going to the RCIA program <laughs> than I did. So I would just encourage anyone who is married and their spouse is becoming a Catholic to go with them. And I think, uh, like my wife, you'll be amazed at what, what you learn. Thanks, Richard. Bye -bye. Thanks, Richard. Excellent point. Yeah, we hear that often. We hear that often. Yeah, I mean, it, it, we need to yeah, well, know kind of cases. I hear it about the Journey Home program. I mean, yeah. some people think this program is only for people on the journey, but how many Catholics have told us that we watch the show and it helps them appreciate a faith that sometimes they take yeah. for granted? That's right. I mean, if John Paul taught the world anything, it's that conversion is ongoing and ever deepening yeah. and it yeah. never stops. And I think that's true for cradle Catholics. And, you know, they are blessed by the conversions, and yet the converts are blessed by those who've been holding down the fort for all those many years as well. It's really a nice little feedback loop, you know. Uh, you're going on your 25th year as a Catholic, and, and you'll be about your 21st. Tw 21st, okay. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I mean, there were so many reasons that opened your heart to the church originally. But what I've found in the work we do is that often it's after 10, 15, 20 years that you begin to truly appreciate mm -hmm. some things in the church now that you didn't see way back when, for whatever reasons, because of the baggage. Yeah. We got to get the back. What about for you? Any surprises after all these years that you, you've really come to appreciate more or that were new to you? I would say the one thing that really strikes me now after a quarter of a century is the passion of Christ. Just a simple crucifix. Uh, on the one hand, it just struck me a few years after becoming a Catholic, how everybody universally acknowledges that Jesus' death at Calvary was a sacrifice, despite the fact that it occurred to me that no Jew standing there at Calvary on Good Friday could have possibly described that event as a sacrifice, because it was outside the walls of Jerusalem, far from the temple, no altars, no priests, thus no sacrifice. It was a Roman execution, pure and simple. So how is it that the passion of Christ at Calvary became known universally as the supreme sacrifice only by backing up to Holy Thursday and looking at Good Friday in the light of the Eucharist mm -hmm. being instituted. The Eucharist, I think, is what illuminates the mystery of Christ's passion for us so much more than I realized when I was a Catholic at the first year. And I would also say this, that another truth that's really struck me now after a quarter of a century that I didn't see coming was how it is the church is the body of Christ, and not as a metaphor, but as a mystery. And that's why Jesus calls the church in different times of history to undergo a passion. What the body of Christ is undergoing right now at this point in the 21st century, I think can only be described accurately as reliving the passion of Christ. The church's passion is what's going to make better sense out of our experience as Catholics at this point in salvation history than anything else I have found. And I didn't see that at all. 25 years ago. Did you see this verse when you were, you, know, you saw them all in your press. Galatians 3.1 Who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Right. What was he talking about? 
publicly portrayed as crucified. They hadn't been there. Right. Mm. In the Mass. That's right. Mm. I mean, that's got to be what he's talking about. In the Word, in the proclamation, but in the Eucharist. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11. And so you really have, suddenly, this is not an execution. In light of Holy Thursday, this is a sacrifice. Nobody took his life. He freely gave it. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks. Why? Because he didn't know he was going to be betrayed? He knew he was going to be betrayed, and worse. (laughs) But he gave thanks because he knew what the Eucharist would do with that death, would be transforming into a sacrifice and a sacrament for us all to undergo a kind of love that we could never do on our own. What you can... Yeah, for me, I think it's new depths of prayer. Um, Mm. And I don't want to come off like I'm super deep in prayer, but I'm discovering as our children are marrying and leaving home, uh, why you so often see grandparents on their knees, you know, and we so quickly say, all I can do is pray, which I am discovering at new levels is not an all thing. It's a wonderful thing. And so being able to offer my mass or my rosary each day for a particular family member going deeper in the devotion to um, the Stations of the Cross, which we have now up in our woods, Um, uh, praying, um, well, especially uh, reading the lives of the saints and praying with them. And so I've read the the, uh, story of the soul recently. I'm reading this wonderful book, um, Catherine of Siena. And, and, and then I can only read two or three pages, and then I need to close it, and I want to pray in a similar way, you know, and have them teach me. And so that, that sent, I mean, St. Francis of Rome is very, very close to my heart, and St. Elizabeth um, Seton, uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton. It, just certain saints have become really spiritual friends, and I, I anticipate that deepening in my life. And so I'm so grateful for these treasures of the church that, um, that I'm in a sense sort of uncovering and it's, it's theological, but it's not just theology. It's, it's deeper prayer. It's deeper prayer. Yeah. I was going to say that, uh, I wish we had more time to talk about the whole thing because for me, one of the main things I discovered as coming in the church was a quote that I heard from T.S. Eliot that Tom Howard quotes in his book on, on the four, in the quartets. When T.S. Eliot said that the way up and the way down are one and the same. I mean, in other words, my understanding of my spiritual journey wasn't just the evangelical, you know, God's going to bless you if you're good. It was, no, it's suffering. It, we, the more we grow, grow to learn about prayer, also the more we learn about how far we've got to go, but it's right. both in the same. Right. We're on the journey. Yeah. The redemptive suffering was something I never thought about. Even on the journey, it came later. Mm-hmm. We do have an email from Alan from Pennsylvania. I am a Methodist pastor, mm-hmm. and I've been drawn to Catholicism for several years. How can I tell my congregation of my desire to become Catholic? I don't want them to feel that I am abandoning them. Mm-hmm. This is actually kind of a mm-hmm. question we get a lot from guys that are in the no man's land. They know they're to become Catholic, but they're not right. You know, that's well, you just gave me the first step to the answer because contact the Coming Home Network and mm-hmm. get involved in not only the email and the phone conversations with the people here, you know, at the Coming Home Network, but even more with the people that your network can put them in touch with. Because, you know, oh, I tried this, but you don't want to try that, you know? Or I tried this and it really worked with my congregation. Uh, And again, you know, congregations are like converts and marriages. They're all unique, and so the one size doesn't fit all. But at the same time, one person's story will help another person who's going through that struggle. I think the most important thing is just to reaffirm the fact that I am more in love with Christ today than ever before, more committed to sacred scripture than ever before, mm-hmm. and more committed to the people of God. And so what I'm about to share with you in the next few months might come as a shock to you as it has for me, but it's, it's a result of falling more deeply in love with Christ mm-hmm. and staying closer to the Word. Mm-hmm. You want to add to that? Can no, I, th- I okay. think that's, that's very good. Wow, we've got a uh, minute and a half. Let's say somebody's sitting at home, Protestant, where you were. Real quickly, what would you like to tell them <laughs> that why they should make the same journey home you all made? Mm. 
Eucharist. I mean the Eucharist. The Eucharist is not only what illuminates Good Friday as more than an execution, but a true sacrifice. The Eucharist is what illuminates the reason why Paul called the church the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3. Why not a synagogue, you know, where there's a scroll and a rabbi? Why a temple? Because there's a priest, there's an altar, and there's a holy sacrifice, and that's the Eucharist. And that is Jesus. He is the priest. He is the victim. If you're in love with him, find him in the Holy Eucharist. <laughs> and, and I would say, you know, Jesus died to give you all these treasures of the church. And he wants you to know his Heavenly Father better. He also wants you to know his mother, who is a spiritual mother for you. And the saints are older brothers and sisters. You do not need to be as alone as you are. There's a whole host of heaven ready, willing, able to, to strengthen you and pray for you and, and be a part of your lives. And, and so many other treasures, um, I would say, you know, join us, please. <laughs> please home. join us. Come home. Well, thank you Come both. Home. You know, of course, my wife and I both thank you for your witness because mm-hmm. uh, just as you said a moment ago, because of your journey, it, we had somebody to talk to on the journey that helped us so much. Uh, and I also want to thank the audience uh, for joining us, uh, go to SalvationHistory.com uh, on EWTN Religious Catalog. You'll see lots of books by both these uh, fine Christians, and uh, they're here to help you in your journey. Thank you for joining us on this program. God bless you. See you next week. Mm-hmm.